to everyone. Um, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. I can go through the whole range of um, greetings because we really do have a global audience in here, which I'm so excited about. I'm also very nervous. Um, this is my first webinar um, that I've ever hosted or created. Um, before we get into why I created this webinar and what this webinar is going to entail, I would just like to go through a few housekeeping rules, if I may. Um, they've got a few technical issues already. <laughs> see. Okay, perfect. So housekeeping. So first of all, I just want us to all be aware of our current mental health. Um, we will be discussing some heavy topics um, around issues regarding race, equity, and social justice. And I know there's a lot going on generally in the world. There is unfortunately a lot of depression in the atmosphere. So if it does get a bit too heavy for you, um, please feel free to leave. We won't take it personally. Um, this is going to be recorded. So everybody who registers will get a recording. The only thing we won't be recording speaker is um, question and answer. Um, so what the structure of this will be, um, we've got some, got three presenters. We were meant to have five, but unfortunately due to unforeseen circumstances, two can't speak. Um, so what we'll do is we're going to run through um, everyone's presentation and then we'll stop recording. And that's when we'll open up to comments, um, questions, reflections. Um, what I would say is with uh, any comments or questions or reflections, please, could you just be mindful of the language you use, just making sure it's accessible and inclusive. Um, like I said, we will be talking about a lot of things that could trigger um, people, um, whether it's people who have unfortunately experienced issues regarding um, race and inequity or on the other hand people who are privileged enough to not have to undergo certain things um i know myself personally i do use words such as um white supremacy rather than words such as diversity and inclusion for me personally uh words such as diversity and inclusion are softer words that are skirting around the real issue and the real issue is the effects of white supremacy, which in a lot of people's heads, they associate it with like Nazism and fascism and overt racism. But the white supremacy that I will be talking about is just the racial power and domination and privilege of whiteness that's still complicit in our societies and is still complicit within our, the library sector, which is the whole reason why I have wanted to create this webinar. I'm very passionate about talking about how the library is still complicit within white supremacy. And in the case of this webinar, how is the library so complicit by failing to talk about technology and all the different issues that are embedded within technology and which our wonderful speakers will be sharing. We would really also encourage you to, if you use Twitter or, or any form of social media, please may use the hashtag CritLib versus tech. CritLib stands for critical librarianship and critical librarianship is um, librarianship that does unapologetically um, talk about these issues, doesn't pretend that the library sector is a neutral um, vocation. Um, so that's where the CritLib stands for. So we really encourage you um, to please uh, use this hashtag because like the whole reason why, one of the reasons why I wanted to do this webinar is to start conversations and promote awareness. So that is the housekeeping done. So now I can formally um, begin the webinar and just do a short introduction. So like I said to everyone, thank you um, for joining. Um, didn't know there'd be so many people. Um, so I think that really shows that this type of webinar is needed and people are interested in this, in this topic, which is great. 
the reason why I wanted to create this webinar is because I, I won't say I personally feel, but I also have evidence, which I will be showing in my presentation, that academic librarians, those who work in universities, are very, I would argue, silent about all the inequities that are embedded within the digital technologies that we use within our academic institutions. And like I said, I do have some evidence. So we are at a stage, thankfully, the library sector and, and most of us here, um, I think we are at a stage where we are recognizing that the library does have problems in a lot of people's popular imagination. It's this uh, safe, sacred space. Um, there's a concept called vocational awe, which um, kind of is about, it refers to this, this idea of the library being neutral and safe. And to, to an extent it is, but when we look at it structurally and systematically, there are a lot of problems. And this is why we, we see a lot of libraries now talking about that decolonizing. And I just want to start by saying that there are a lot, there's a lot of debate about this word. I personally don't like the word decolonizing. For me, I would argue that when we're talking about um, you know, adding more ethnic minorities or people from marginalized and minority backgrounds to reading lists or, or to, to increasing um, staff membership, because for those who don't work in libraries, like it's overwhelmingly white. Um, I don't have the specific figures, but I know in America and the UK, it's over 97% of librarians identify as white so a lot of people are talking about those issues versus kind of really talking about the systemic problems that are within libraries um and like i said decolonizing what what we are doing is not decolonizing a lot of people think it's inclusion it's like adding people to the table, inviting them to the table, whereas this may sound very controversial, which is why at the beginning of my housekeeping, I mentioned, you know, please be mindful of how certain words make you feel. And we can talk about certain words um, in the question and answer. Um, but decolonizing is not asking for a seat at the table. Decolonizing would, true decolonizing would actually be about breaking that table up distributing the wood from that table to different groups in an equitable way um what we, it really would be dismantling the library as we know it dismantling all these structures as we know it so what we're doing i wouldn't say is decolonizing we're just doing inclusion work which is a good step but it's not it's not where we hopefully will end up um if we really are serious about creating radical uh, social justice and like I said radical to me it means being unapologetically accountable and truthful and knowing that the, these are difficult conversations but if you really want to name a problem if you really want to solve a problem we have to name it so this is where we're at in libraries the kind of conversations we're having however I, we don't see technology being mentioned when it when it comes to inclusion and diversity and decolonizing, which is why I wanted to um, start a conversation, basically. And for me, it's like, I'm not sure why we aren't talking about technology when there's so much information about all the issues that are embedded within different aspects of the techno of technology which affect students, which affect staff, which issue affect everybody who uses the internet. Um, these are um, sources that I used for my dissertation. My dissertation was, I was arguing how academic libraries, they, during COVID and because of COVID, they, there was a new emphasis on digital inequality, but academic libraries seem to only define digital inequality as people who don't have access to the internet or access to laptops or don't have competent um, digital skills. Whereas these sources show that 
there are multiple inequalities and emphasis on the plural and these really affect people who come from marginalized and minoritized um, communities and identities so for me it's like why do we not talk about that when the information is there is it that we just don't know that it's there or do we know that it's there and we just don't care um you know these are this is why I wanted to create this webinar and I think one thing as well that is very apparent and something I should acknowledge um these authors are American um they're there are very few uh, UK librarians or European librarians talking about this issue. Um, Andrew Preeter, who's here, um, uh, is probably one of the few librarians from the UK who has talked about how technology, and he specifically looks at technology within the library sector, the inequalities embedded within it. Um, so that, again, was a reason why I wanted to start um, this webinar. I'm London-based. Um, I just want, and I'm so happy that I see a lot of people from UK institutions or European, because America, when it comes to, I would say anything kind of critical, anything, um, anything that is progressive, America seems to be at the forefront. So it really is time for Europe and the UK to catch up. Saying that though, I'm also very aware that we are from the global north. Um, this conversation needs to include people from the global south, which is why I'm very glad that one of our speakers, Damilera, is here, um, who's from sub-Saharan Africa, um, because we need to have we need to have a, a perspective that reflects everybody, basically. So this is kind of me personally thinking, like, why is it that we don't really talk about technology? Is it because we have all these assumptions um, about technology. And um, if there are any academics um, here, any teachers, especially um, lecturers who uh, teach social science, teach um, critical thinking, they may recognize some of these words. So these words, epistemology, ontology, te tele I can't even say this word, it's very hit and miss if I say certain words, which I think is one of the problems when it comes to um, critical theory is not accessible for anyone. But why I put these words down is because for me personally, I think maybe this is one of the things we still are not grappling with. We have this idea that technology is for everyone. Technology is neutral. Technology is here to bring about human development. But when you actually study this and dig deep, you'll see that the assumptions about technology are all from Eurocentric um, perspectives. Um, the it's all unfortunately our in our definitions of technology are influenced by capitalism. So for example, the whole reason why technology is seen as the only symbol of civilization superiority and it's like a universal solution for everyone is because this message has been defined and spread by the West and the West holds the most power and privilege. Um, so this is why there is this argument in society, especially for uh, countries from who are not from the global north that in order to advance in society especially in western society you have no other option but to use our technology and this means because of these type of um, assumptions embedded assumptions which is what epistemology means because of these embedded ideas of the origins of technology how it was it pretty much has been brought by the west and is being maintained and carried by the west so ontology and um, the kind of goals of technology, um, you can argue just to kind of spread this model of what counts as civilization, civilizational superiority it is very problematic. And it means, for, for example, that technology has, our current technology has ignored the way that technology and knowledge from the culture of marginalized communities that's not counted as technology. It's ignored um, that knowledge and expressing expressing different definitions of what is technology. Um, we only define it as the internet or written records. We don't count um, 
I know in like different indigenous communities, for example, it's like there's so much power in the oral word and the forms of technology that have come from the indigenous world, we we just don't teach in UK institutions, um, which is, goes back to my point of what a real decolonizing university, what it would look like. It would be taking into account different forms of knowledge from different people and not just prioritizing and privileging Western forms of knowledge. And just generally speaking, there is a focus on bringing technology, resources and knowledge into communities that the West defines as lacking, the West defines as, you know, needing to, to tap into our knowledge and our strength. So maybe this is, I'm hoping that this webinar will start to challenge these um, assumptions, these definitions that I think we kind of subconsciously carry. And what I also would say I want this webinar to achieve is, yeah, to change perspectives. And we really do have in, in UK institutions, well, in higher end, Higher, higher education institutions in general really do have this techno deterministic perspective and what I mean by that is this idea that technology is great technology is wonderful and I've just taken an example of um, a statement that was made by JISC and for those who don't know what JISC is JISC is basically like an, a very influential network um, within um, universities and it just promotes IT services digital resources it promotes research um, like information and they had a strategy where they're you know kind of predicting trends and uh, predicting trends of universities when it comes to technology and because of because of the way universities now are becoming very commercialized they're becoming you can definitely argue they're becoming brands they want to take they're taking influence from companies like Netflix Apple and Uber and the same, we need to use their technology and this will help the student experience. But as you can see from this slide, like these forms of surveillance that Netflix and Apple, Uber, all the things that these companies do to try and capture data, to kind of predict data, very, very, very inherently um, racist, um, a lot of embedded in inequity, which is what these books that I mentioned talk about and which I'm I'm just confused why universities are just seeming to just not be aware of this knowledge or I don't know it's just very confusing and disappointing which is why I made this webinar and coming up finally um you know I really want I just really want this webinar to stimulate conversation and like I said at the beginning there's so much there are so many issues within technology from uh, UK, I should stop saying UK perspective because actually it's just from a perspective of higher education. Like there are so many issues within technology, especially when it comes to how we learn. And Caroline, who was who was meant to be a speaker but is unfortunately ill, um, you know she she's very vocal on Twitter about um, in this case Elsevier. And for people who don't know Elsevier, Elsevier is a big um, publisher. Um, students get we get a lot of our journals a uh, lot of articles um, from companies like Elsevier um, in my job as a subject librarian having to buy having to buy resources for students and I think people if you don't know how much it costs a lot of the time just to buy subscription to an article subscription to a journal that would be very useful for students academics researchers is like it's in the thousands and this is just a tweet saying that you know Elsevier this 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 publisher that is meant to be for student education its profit margin is larger than Google Apple and Shell and that's all because of how much it's charging so these issues in relation to the commercialization of education, the inequity that's embedded within education and really the technology that supports this inequity really needs to be spoken about. And I'm very aware that it is difficult to speak about issues. Um, there are repercussions a lot of the time for being so vocal about issues. And that's why I created this um, hashtag, which I really hope people can use because there really is power in numbers. And, you know, there, 
I don't know how many people are in this webinar right now, but, you know, it's a sizable number of people who either care about these, these issues or are interested in caring and knowing about these issues. So I would just really encourage everyone to, you know, be vocal and hopefully this webinar will install knowledge and more confidence to be vocal about technology. And so, yeah, this is why finally coming to the end, why I, you know, created this webinar and, you know, this webinar, we're going to hear from, like I said, different speakers who will be sharing their own perspective, their own things that they, that strikes them in their heart and love, they're very passionate about. And, you know, hopefully we'll have a very stimulating conversation. So thank you for listening. And um, I would like to introduce our speaker. Um, I'm just going to stop sharing the screen um, one minute. So I would like to introduce, um, so I'm just trying to maximize my screen so I can see my writing. <laughs> I would like to introduce Dr. Amelia Gibson, who is an associate professor and the director of the Community Equity Data and Information Lab at the College of Information Studies, University of Maryland, College Park. Her research focuses on information marginalization, trust and safety in health and learning institutions, including libraries, education, and online spaces but her work has a specific emphasis on maternal health equity and disability justice. Her current work centers on the study of risk, harm and marginalization in socio-technical information systems. And she conducts research to support the use of defensive information behaviors by individuals who are marginalized in order to reduce the harm related to data and information in institutional educational settings. In addition to her academic roles, Dr. Gibson is a faculty affiliate with the Center for Information Technology and Public Life and Center for Critical Race and Digital Studies, and she's a researcher with the Postnatal Patient Safety Learning Lab. Um, so I'm going to stop sharing. And hopefully, Amelia, you are able to share. And I'm also going to turn my camera off and mute. And I would encourage it for people to turn their camera off if they're not speaking. Thank you. Can everyone hear me? Is my mic working? OK, good. I plugged in a new mic, so I wanted to make sure it was working. All right, let me share my screen. This is slow. Okay. All right. Is it? Can you see my screen now? Is my presentation showing? Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Great. And you know, I well, I don't know about the bandwidth, but I'm fine with people not turning off their cameras. Either way, I teach classes um, online, so I see those faces all the time. Sometimes they're encouraging. Okay, so I wanna thank Naomi for inviting me. Um, I wanna thank Allison for inviting me and for, um, for helping me get this together. Um, I'm gonna be talking about on the topic of new struggles for old rights. And if you see me looking to the side, I always have my standard disclaimers. I'm on a laptop today, which means I have to look off of my computer to get my notes. And there are three children in this house. So they're downstairs doing their schoolwork, but you might hear someone pop in and ask for something really important like gum or something else like that. And that is just the reality of being me right now, so. All right. For some reason I cannot share and... Are you good to make my slides? Oh yeah, there we go. On. Yeah, there, there we go. go. There we go. All right. So in the in June of 2022, um, the governor of Missouri signed Missouri State Bill 775, which uses an expansive definition of explicit sexual material 
to prevent children and teens from reading controversial books in schools. Signed this into law. So this law makes sharing material deemed explicit with students under 18, a class A misdemeanor, which is punishable by up to one year in jail. On October 14th of last year, the Missouri Secretary of State proposed an administrative rule that would also prevent public libraries from purchasing, oh, is it black? Oh, let's see then. No, I think it's good. You're fine. Okay. Yeah. Okay, good. <laughs> um, from purchasing any materials that, quote, appeal to the prurient interest of a minor or granting any minor access to materials not approved by that minor's parent or guardian. Okay. So if you've ever taken a child to the library um, or seen children in libraries, imagine what that looks like. Um, okay. So this rule also made it illegal for school and public libraries to, to purchase challenged and banned books and limited Missourians' ability to use materials, view displays, or participate in events that local parents might deem, quote, inappropriate. Any local parents might deem inappropriate. As of last year, 11 states had book bans, um, book ban laws on the books, and and thousands of books over hundreds of countries have been banned even without these laws, right? So these laws have mainly been used to challenge um, books by black, disabled and LGBTQIA authors under the guise of parental rights and under the guise of protecting children from indecent and sexually explicit materials, right? Um, and in, in many cases, the process for enforcement has been similar to state level bans that we've seen um, on abortion related information and anti-abortion laws in the same states. So this, this strategy is empowering local, usually con the conservative citizens to bring legal challenges and to force teachers and librarians into expensive time consuming hearings or to bring charges against staff that must be defended, right? Or, or they would face fines and jail time. In response, schools and libraries across many states have found themselves preemptively emptying their shelves of, of books by these authors, um, closing libraries, or finding themselves unable to keep qualified staff. Now, it's tempting to think that none of this is your concern, right? These are mostly you're mostly academic librarians in a different country. Not I'm not even in the same state, right? So this is this is not my concern. Um, and honestly, it bothered me a little bit at first, but book banning in elementary schools wasn't really my thing. Like I don't, it's not my research thing. Um, although I do work with youth in libraries, really I work with youth um, in terms of how we structure, understanding how we structure marginalization. How do we create marginalization? Um, and the processes by which we push certain people, whether we call them users or customers or communities uh, or patrons or whatever else, when they engage with our institutions, how we push them to the social and the political margins, um, the edges of our society through policies and systems. How we use information and data in spaces and in public in systems and spaces like libraries, schools, and healthcare to enforce these harmful social orders, right? So um, I explore how we continue to harm those individuals by not focusing on their needs, how we build institutions that are sometimes too dangerous for them to engage with, um, and so the marginalization for me was the issue. So as a side, an explanatory comment, as we like to say, um, marginalization often doesn't look like outright, outright denial of access, right? So Naomi was talking a little bit about this. Marginalization um, sometimes looks like individuals and communities being excluded in practice through a mix of implicit and explicit threats to their well-being, right? To, to them as individuals, to them as family units, to them as communities, threats on privacy, erosion of civil rights, the threat of state violence, the threat of epistemic violence, which Naomi did a really great job of explaining earlier. So the idea of harms based in ways of knowing, delegitimizing certain ways of knowing, dismissing information needs, information values, practices of some communities as unsophisticated or uncivilized or punishing their use, right? Um, so these are the things we, that I study. So marginalization in education systems though, see why it's coming back around for me, might look like banning civil rights history um, or, or banning diversity or equity in higher education, which we see happening in Florida right now. There's, there's a lawsuit um, against the governor of the state for attempting to ban um, any discussion of diversity or equity. Um, and so 
what happens in that, that kind of system is students and faculty of color are punished or, dis or they tend to disengage because of, they, because of uh, a lack of support in the system. They, a lack of promotion, a lack of support, a lack of inclusion. Um, yes, there are groups like, thank you, Emily, uh, Moms of Liberty who've been showing up to schools and library board meetings, all of us, we will talk about that, to push for bans, right? Um, and so this is what marginalization looks like, right? This is the anti, <laughs> the anti, anti-racism that we've seen um, expanding in many American school systems, this outright claim to, of being against anti-racism, which is uh, very troubling. And in response to this, what we, we see are the disparities that we, we, we bemoan all the time, right? These are the, this is information poverty. So we, we see people opting out of our systems, not thriving within systems, engaging with defensive secrecy or using other strategies to keep them safe, themselves safe, right? Marginalization in healthcare for us in the United States. Oh yes, so we've seen more and more I will say overt, um, overt anti, anti, more overt racism in school systems. Add that. So marginalization in healthcare um, in the United States has looked like arresting pregnant women for violating abortion bans based on their internet searches or text messages, which we've seen happen more and more frequently over the last few years. Um, it looks like trigger laws in states. Uh, that have impacts beyond uh, actual violation of those laws, right? So it makes it, makes it so difficult for um, care to be provided that they create um, these harmful situations for everyone beyond, beyond just the, the, target, the targeted group. Um, it looks like weaponizing fear and surveil, oh, sorry. It looks like weaponizing fear to justify surveillance in the name of prioritizing safety or improving service while ignoring the harms, the, the community harms that these um, carceral politics, these politics of, um, uh, of control, right, have caused in marginalized communities. So for the, work, for, for the most part, my work has focused on public and school libraries as public places, not really as school libraries. I'm not, um, I'm not a school librarian. Um, and so, these places should be should be accessible to citizens at different citizens of different ages. Yes, um, but I haven't really been in it for the children's books per se. I have friends who are children's librarians and who love children's libraries. Um, so I understand why some people like like me would think at first that banning children's books in Missouri or Texas is a shame, you know, but it doesn't really affect you directly. Um, but these bans haven't remained limited to children's books. They've expanded, as I as I noted, into um, openly racist, ableist, and sexist discourse and policy in public spaces. And that is something that we should all be concerned about, right? I'm finding more and more disturbing intersections between my work in marginalization, my work in marginalization in obstetric and maternal health spaces, information and data systems, my, my disability justice work, and these bans that have grown into like full-fledged anti-diversity bills that make equity and by extension disparity um, that, that work illegal in some hospital systems, in some school systems, right? In some universities here. So uh, I wanna note that the US has terrible, <laughs> terrible maternal and maternal mortality rates and morbidity rates for black and indigenous women. So this is something that disproportionately, again, affects these communities that are already marginalized by these processes. And I talk about marginalization as a process, not just as a, a label for a group of people. These, they limit com comprehensive sex, sexual health education and access to health, sex ed resources for children and young adults in many states, threatening to turn back decades of progress on sexual health goals, HIV AIDS goals, domestic abuse reduction goals, and other improvements that are, br are brought about by this kind of education and information, public information. So it became clear to me that I should be concerned because these bills were part of a more comprehensive strategy to shape public access to information, public education, and ultimately shape public discourse around race, gender, and sexuality. And it all started with these local board meetings, right? We all saw these local board meetings popping up in the news all over the country and people were kind of taken aback. Sorry, I need to get some water. So I get, the, I get, I also get the assumption. Oh, 
I would also understand the assumption, although I'm reading that it's not um, the assumption anymore. But I've heard from, in the past from, from colleagues um, in, in different European countries that the racism and ableism and sexism and the anti-trans sentiment within the US are American problems, that this is not something that, that um, the UK has had to deal with. Um, and so I understand well-meaning questions of like how you can help and like, what does this have to do with me? But I would like to encourage you to think about um, the connections between us and the risks for these kinds of movements here, like wh wherever you are, right? Um, this is not, so the, as, as someone mentioned, the book ban, the book bans are being pushed now in the UK. And so I, 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 would, I would warn you to, um, I would not warn, I would ask you to think about how these might impact you um, in your space. Right. Public access to information is one of the cores of government, politics, and civil life. And when we consider close connections between information and data policies and national and local politics, it becomes clear that if there, every, if there ever were American issues or British issues, these don't really exist anymore. We sh we're in this, we're all sharing the same water at this point. And although this audience is mostly outside the US, I think it should deeply concern all of you, all of you because recent history has shown us that these rollbacks on civil rights and, the, and regressive discourses have spread um, beyond our borders. Um, if, the, if the past few years have shown us anything though, I would say it's the power of global solidarity and in international movements for better and for worse, right? Moving forward because it's 1042. Okay, so in 2020, the Black Lives Matter movement challenged was challenged by sort of the right wing nationalism of Brexit supporters. Um, in his in his paper, "Do Black Lives Matter in a Post Brexit Brit Britain?" Uh, theolo theology theology ah, <laughs> this is my word theology and um, Anthony Reddy writes whether we do so or not, nothing will will change the toxic climate that has been unleashed by the Leave campaign. Whether Britain leaves or not, a majority of the nation has spoken its mind in terms of aligning with the toxic xenophobic, xenophobic fueled subcontext of the Leave campaign that has othered visible minorities and created an explicitly white centered discourse around the nature of Britishness and notions of belonging. The topicality of Brexit will wane, but the sense that Britain has been dragged back into the dark ages Enoch Powell rhetoric and around rivers of blood will not be dissipated anytime soon. So these are very similar, very similar contexts. Um, I mean, very similar uh, uh, responses that we saw that year, that summer of 2020, right? So in the United States, our, our protests are our um, similar parallel tension to Black Lives Matter was the coronavirus lockdown protest, right? So there were these, um, these protests that were aimed against COVID-19 mitigations that would flow into school board meetings for the next year or more that will result in arguments and challenges and death threats for school, school board members across the country, for politicians. Um, one of the most well-known of these was the Michigan State House where armed protesters walked into the legislative chamber. And late later that year, 13 men would be arrested for the plot to kidnap the, ma the mayor of Michigan, right? Um, this was coupled by this politicization of of information, health information around COVID. Um, and th there was this, the, the same sort of complex discourse that felt like a backlash against anti-racism and a, a reason to, to protest, right? At a time when the protest was about, about solidarity, anti-racist solidarity, solidarity around the world. Um, all of these things though, sort do have, have um, these connections have implications for libraries, right? So this is not just about parallel national politics or struggles for justice. We also share these information civil rights issues. Um, when library vendors collect and contribute massive amounts of AI and machine learning training data from patrons and users and community members and allow governments to bypass limitations on government, um, government search and, and, um, and engage in what could be called overreach, right? Um, there are responsibilities. There are things that we should we should be thinking about in terms of their relationship to this these anti anti racist movements. Like, what does it mean to collect uh, 
large amounts of data to be used for for immigration, to be used for um, protest, anti-protest movements, right? The world, I would say our world is small and we rely on each other to model solutions. We, we see our, to see our parallels and to model solutions that we can share. So I'm gonna end by saying about five years ago, Joy Bulamwini, the, the founder of the algorithm Algorithmic Justice League um, recounted the story of two bots half a world apart um, with the same problem that she had encountered. Neither could see her face, literally. They couldn't see her face, right? Um, and both in her graduate lab at MIT and on a trip in, to Hong Kong, these bots, which were run on the same algorithm, um, couldn't work without her using a white mask, a literal white mask over her face um, for her to use them. A fix, a single fix, would have meant improvements worldwide, right? Um, I, to me, this is a really uh, striking story because there are, I think it illustrates the futility of, of sort of nationalist approaches to um, understanding information issues and information and data um, in terms of civic engagement and responsibility, civic, civil rights. Um, and so, although many, although many of our political battles in the United States are very specific um, reprisals of, of fights for basic human rights that have already happened in US history, um, that we have believed to long be settled, the right to vote, the right to read freely, equal rights under the law, bodily autonomy, just the very basic agreement that diversity, equity, inclusion, and justice are good things. Um, these are things that I see moving across to other countries as well. So um, if we're to do the work of librarianship, of cultivating these systems and these institutions, dedicating to help helping the public gain access to information in our various communities, we must recognize that this is always gonna be political work and this is always work that we must do in solidarity with each other. Thank you. Thank you so much, Amelia. Okay, so I'm just um, going to introduce the next speaker and just like to encourage you to continue tweeting. I'll be, I was on Twitter just now and there's a lot of great comments. So please continue tweeting using the hashtag CritLib versus tech. So now we're moving on to Damilera Oyedeli, who describes himself as a librarypreneur with a wealth of knowledge and experience in the library space in sub-Saharan Africa. He has been implementing various programs to improve library usage and capacity building of young library professionals, making libraries more viable through digital technology and citizen engagement approaches through Library Aid Africa. And Damilera, would you like to come and um, introduce to what you're talking about, please? Thank you so much, Naomi, for, for inviting me over, and, and it's glad to hear from colleagues who are also sharing um, various experiences in this context. I'll be diving more into, you know, how this applies to certain African countries and what are the challenges that we face here. But I'll also dive into solutions to address this from the policy, uh, capacity, service and particular perspective, uh, giving context in Southern Africa. So digital divide has been a significant issue in developing countries in Southern African countries uh, where access to technology and internet connectivity is limited. However, the COVID-19 pandemic has further highlighted the extent of this problem, right? Uh, as more people relying on digital technologies for education, our work, and other social services. So digital inequalities have a significant impact uh, on delivering library services uh, in Southern Africa. Libraries have traditionally played uh, a unique role in providing access to information, uh, promoting literacy, and supporting education. However, uh, with the growing importance of digital technologies, libraries are facing new challenges, okay, in meeting the future needs of their communities, okay. And in Southern Africa, it became more evident during the height of the COVID-19 pandemic, where uh, the closure of libraries, of library spaces in context here, uh, due to the pandemic, worsened the, the access to library services, uh, the services they offer. And second thing is that uh, librarians not have the fear of, okay, uh, what if the pandemic takes longer than we thought? Are we going to lose our jobs, right? Okay, and what will be the importance and the relevance of libraries uh, in the post-COVID world? 
And also, what skills do we need to provide library services during and after the COVID-19 pandemic? These are the emerging concerns then uh, among librarians uh, in Southern African countries where libraries were closed. Okay. And the above further connotes the existential global library challenges, uh, which of course have various contexts based on, on the regions where we come from. All right. Thus, diving into the inequalities of library service delivery that exist in the digital era in context of Southern Africa, I will give some practical examples and experiences which I have also gone through myself uh, in this context. So what, one major thing I'm going to start with is the inability to access of paid resources, platform require you to pay a lot of money to access articles or journals uh, that your library or your institution are unable to pay for, okay? And this for that calls for uh, advocacy and intervention around open houses, right? And second point here is data availability and access to libraries electronically in terms of institutional repository and platforms to host resources and engage users electronically uh, in the digital era. Right. And diving further is capacity of librarians to unearth and navigate the digital ecosystems to offer equitable library services delivery. And also looking at digital infrastructure uh, for libraries to offer digital access, and also the policy around the intellectual property access uh, to share and reuse our content online. Okay, so let's have a few, few, few challenges and causes to the inequalities that exist in private library services and digital era in the context of social and African countries. However, uh, during the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, we did, we did sort of, of virtual consultations that have shown us to understand uh, what are the challenges libraries were facing back then in, in, in Southern Africa, what are the potential solutions that can be announced to, to address this, okay? So realize that library professionals have various roles to play uh, to reinvent library services and reach more users during after the global pandemic. Uh, in this context, this has to be categorized uh, into three major areas we have we, we did then, uh, which we currently apply now in, in the course of intervention. Okay, one is library leadership role. Number two, uh, make going digital, making libraries digital, and number three, showing the libraries and librarians acquire the emerging skills and training to do so. All right. So in summary. We are trying to call on library leaders to provide the vision and develop uh, the partnerships that will enable African libraries to realize the potentials, okay, uh, on libraries and those that support them to ensure that that there is the right infrastructure, uh, their equipment and laws to deliver service digitally, and finally to ensure that this comes with the skills needed uh, for librarians to realize their potential to support their communities, okay. So. Going forward, I'm going to dive into more context of what library leadership role uh, should look like, which uh, all the major findings will realize in the context of digital access and, in and inequalities uh, for libraries in digital era. One, so library leadership role uh, plays uh, a fundamental role in energizing and coordinating library associations and institutions, staff and stakeholders to prepare libraries and librarians uh, to serve better and serve the community they, they work in digitally. Activity, activities to drive progress providing equitable digital access uh, to library services delivery. And under this context, um, I'm going to propose three key major initiatives or interventions possibly that, 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 that they can be potentially adopted uh, by library leadership uh, to track progress forward. One, the first thing here is to try to engage in-country stakeholders and communities to develop guidelines and policy uh, that will drive and enable libraries and offer equitable, to offer equitable digital access to knowledge. Okay, and number two, Library leaders should prioritize leveraging technology to drive library service delivery. And number three, which is the last key initiative on the this, is that library leadership should advocate uh, to improve library funding and infrastructure development from governments and other stakeholders that, that attach libraries. All right. And going forward to one of the major key uh, areas we that that we think and propose that, you know, these are next step for libraries to drive progress towards. Uh, equitable digital assets is number two, uh, moving libraries digital. Okay, uh, all this came and became much more evident uh, during the COVID-19 pandemic and as it transcend uh, as we, you know, prepare for, for after COVID-19 pandemic back then. Okay, so during the pandemic, a lot of libraries in Africa uh, were disconnected from their users uh, due to closure of physical library spaces. And these libraries lack platforms or capacity and infrastructure to drive online library service delivery, right? And bridging the digital divide, uh, leveraging digital technologies to offer library services uh, became much more important. And now it's becoming much more important uh, than ever, okay? And under this, what are the three key major 
interventions or formative interventions that we think uh, you know, libraries should potentially adopt as a progress. One, provision, provision of ICT facilities both on site and around buildings and infrastructure development that would drive electronic library service delivery. Number two, working with governments in order to ensure that libraries are at the heart of national broadband and connectivity strategies, including supporting both for on-way connectivity, hardware, and skills. And number three, librarians should be able, should be at the forefront in establishing and utilization of e-learning platforms, uh, internal repository software, uh, learning management system, other open educational resources platforms that will further enhance uh, stable access to knowledge electronically. And lastly, under this is identify and engage relevant stakeholders and partners uh, to understand policies and drive copyright reforms uh, appropriate for libraries in the digital age and digital era. Okay, and one last point uh, that we spoke about, which also we've been applying consistently through our intervention, uh, is uh, imagine skills and training for library professionals, okay? Right, uh, to drive progress for equitable access to knowledge electronically. Uh, what are the skills needed by, li by librarians in, to engage with the communities? How can libraries facilitate capacity development programs that will equip professionals with the skills self needed to drive progress? Uh, in our ever changing community as a progress, right? And so libraries have already begun taking on new and new and changing roles in the communities as we progress. However, this also demands you know improved skills, capacity, and confidence from library professionals in order to meet the needs of their communities. So under this path of emerging skills and training, uh, we outlined five major key initiatives that you know, we believe we'll be able to address uh, these existential global library challenges in the digital era that we face uh, currently. When digital skills development, uh, including digital sources, resources, training, and sharing among librarians and libraries with similar user interact uh, features, digital storytelling competence and knowledge to interact with learning management system tools, and learning management system tools, and online retrieval and dissemination of information. Number two, Training of librarians and library leaders are on innovation, innovative skills and ways of adaptation to the new normal, right? And number three, capacity development and training for library professionals on digital skills and ICT knowledge, including leveraging social media platforms uh, that will improve functionality and library services delivery. Number four, uh, use of open source and social media platforms, computer appreciation, application of open source in libraries, and use of other online sources that will further enhance equitable uh, digital assets. And lastly, is training on advocacy, communication skills, program development and management, and policy, and stakeholder engagement, and also data analysis. But these are essential components now that we need to engage stakeholders involved with the situation, how they can improve uh, the state of digital assets uh, equitably for libraries and library users as a progress. So, as I conclude, libraries are also facing challenges in providing digital assets. Of course, this is this is a non fact. Okay, right. Uh, there is a need to ensure that digital services are designed to meet the needs of diverse communities. Okay, including people with disabilities. Yes, and those who speak different languages and those with low literacy levels. Right, and libraries need to ensure that the digital services are sustainable and can be maintained over the long time. Okay, okay, and this further requires investing in infrastructure, uh, training, support needed to manage digital resources effectively. Uh, so critical digital librarianship is essential for delivering library services in Southern Africa, of course. However, libraries need to address and challenge, uh, libraries need to address these things and these challenges by this, of digital inequality by investing in digital infrastructure, Okay, building capacity among librarians, ensuring that digital as services are accessible to everyone, and ensuring that accessibility of digital services is at the core of digital intervention for libraries. So let us work together uh, in adverse localities as we bridge digital divide in the library space and ensure that everyone has access to information they need uh, to thrive in this digital age through library services delivery. Thank you so much. Thank you, Tamilero, for sharing the issues and challenges uh, libraries in Africa are experiencing and reminding us that this is, there's a lot of uh, shared problems um, across global lines, you can say. Um, 
So we're going to move on now to Caroline, who, like I said, unfortunately couldn't be here, but she has sent her PowerPoint and slides. Um, so I'm going to pretend to be Caroline, basically, and share the slides and read her script. So let me just share the screen again. Um, Okay, just getting the script, so bear with me. Oh, I forgot to introduce Caroline, sorry. Well, um, Caroline is an academic librarian at the University of Derby. She was Wikimedian of the Year in 2020 and subsequently became a trustee of Wikimedia UK. She's also co-founded the library ebook SOS ca campaign for fair, open, equitable access to information and resources, something that's very important to her. So Caroline started by um, saying this, and I'm just going to read out what she would have said. Hi, so my name is Caroline Ball. I am an academic librarian at the University of Derby. I am one of the founding members of my institution's academic equality and inclusivity group. And so I'm quite heavily involved in my institution's work around decolonization in inverted commas, anti-racism, equity, and I'm also a member of our LGBTQ plus and allies group. I'm a trustee for Wikimedia UK and an organizer for a campaign called eBook SOS which I suspect the librarians amongst you may have heard of, but for those who, ha who have not, this is basically about agitating and calling for fairer pricing and sales practice in academic publishing. So the issue of fair access to information and removing barriers to information is something I'm very passionate about and I'm involved in a number of fields. Now, you can see from this slide that most of what I want to talk about is very much within this context of decolonization in inverted commas. And I use that term very loosely because a lot of what happens in universities and particularly in relation to libraries is not decolonization at all, largely because of what I plan to talk about in this presentation. But I just wanted to highlight this particular definition of decolonization because it's one of the rare ones I've seen that makes reference to knowledge production. And that is decolonizing the university is an all encompassing project, which calls for us to truly reckon with our complicity in the dominance of Western knowledge production and to dismantle oppressive power structures. And that de definition was by Sue Lemos from University of Warwick. And it's this system of Western knowledge production that is the problem that I want to talk about. The structures and inequity and imbalance in our libraries, the books and resources that they contain. Quite frankly, the entire system of academic and scholarly communication and how it inhibits global research, how it gatekeeps, how it restricts access and narrows the scope of the knowledge available. Oh, hold on, I'm just trying to um trying to change the slide. Oh, one minute, please. Yep, okay. So slide two. One of the things that we rarely do with students and oh, I, Mary, I we can't see your slides now at all. Sorry. Oh, okay, sorry. And you should start um, sharing again. <laughs> share screen. Okay. Perfect. Perfect, okay, thank you. So I'll start that again. So what Caroline wanted to say with this slide is, one of the things that we rarely do with students, and I absolutely include myself in this, is that when we help them with research, teach them, 
and when academics provide them with recommended reading is that we talk about that material, not about its content or the point it's making, it's relevant to the topic at hand, but as its existence as a piece of information and how it was created and why, and the deliberate choices and flaws that exist in that process. Because this ties back to that key definition of decolonization, this big part of this Western knowledge production, that's a bigger issue and is not necessarily within the remit or responsibility of any one individual of uni or university alone to tackle, but recognizing it is the first step. Information is not neutral. Who writes the information, who the information is written about, what the information is about, who gets to have a platform, who gets published, who has their voice amplified, who has their voice suppressed. This is all a huge part of the information cycle that our students rely on for their studies, and none of it is neutral. There are choices made at every single stage, and so libraries aren't neutral. The stock that we hold, the material we provide, in response to modules and programs and curriculum and requests, is all parts of this wider structure that imparts hub in many ways, unconsciously, unintentionally, although maybe by not acknowledging that this is only one part of a much bigger and much richer picture that we are not seeing, it becomes conscious and intentional. So we should talk about that with students because behaving like the absence of some voice is a normal thing, a society of universities have in general for years and years and years is damaging to those students who might have been represented by those absent voices. It's not normal and it's not neutral or universal, universal or reflective of all our, our students' experiences. Now, as much as we might wish we could make sure that every voice and gender and culture and ethnicity and religion is represented in our reading lists and in our libraries and curricula, we can't, mostly because we are subject to bigger forces. And that is really what I want to spend some time talking about, these bigger issues, these structures that are inhibiting us. Firstly, there is the issue of access to what is available. Increasingly, over the last, let's say, decade, libraries have been moving towards a much more digital focused collection. For example, many have an e-first policy. And part of this move has been driven by the desire to make our collections more accessible in recognizing that having the time to spend hours in the library is not a luxury all our students can take advantage of. My own institution has a very high number of part-time students, commuter students, distant learning students, students with jobs, mature students, to whom a print book on the shelf is of very little value because it means that they have to make a special journey in order to get it and return it. And various studies have shown that these students are more likely to be from historically marginalized backgrounds which makes it even more important to ensure the library has the needed material so that they aren't doubly disadvantaged in comparison to their student peers who can afford not to work throughout their studies and who can afford to come to university. So this shift to eBooks has been driven by accessibility concerns. However, there are serious problems with that, particularly when it comes to being able to access diverse content online. A scholar study from a few years back estimated that only 10% of academic texts are even available in digital form for libraries to purchase. So if we are prioritizing digital, we are vastly reducing and restricting the pool of material that is available to us and our students. I've been very vocal over the last few years about eBooks. I'm an organizer of a campaign called eBook SOS, which has really been pushing back against a lot of publisher practice. For example, how many publishers actually refuse to sell eBooks to libraries at all, 
or how they make them extremely expensive or tie them up in packages on bespoke platforms or restrict what users can do with them in comparison to a print copy. I have seen a single textbook priced at £16,000 for just one year's access. I have seen a collection of law texts available for a one-off payment of £113,000. And I'll just repeat that. A collection of law texts available for a one-off payment of £113,000. There's one challenge right there. We can't always get the material, clearly, the material we want in the format that we need because we are subject to these big, bigger market forces. And that's with mainstream material. Western publishers publishing Western-focused research, big academic names. So how much harder do you think it is to find anything outside of that? The vast majority of books and journals in our library and included on our reading list come from a very, very narrow pool of publishers and marginalized voices. This distorts the picture because at the end of the day, these publishers are commercial outfits. They exist to make money. The enhancement of human knowledge very much comes second. So they don't tailor to niche subjects as they consider diverse voices something that doesn't have a big market and they tailor to the big market and what they think will sell. So that is the US and UK market particularly because that market is worth a huge amount of money to academic publishers. I saw a statistic the other day that estimated that UK higher education institutions have spent nearly a billion pounds over the last nine years on journal subscriptions alone with just, wait for it, 10 publishers, all of them UK, US based. How do you think that impacts on what is available to us, how diverse or representative that picture might be and the research we have access to? So, access to existing material. Existing research is a challenge, but what about the research that doesn't happen? the findings that don't get published, the funding that doesn't materialize. The scholarly publishing system itself is riddled with systematic inequality, all of which serves to place further barriers in the way of truly global research reaching its audience. Some of you may be familiar with the concept of weird nations, which is the picture I've put up, which stands for Western, educated, industrial, rich, and democratic. You could probably also add largely white on there as well. These countries, particularly the US and UK, dominate the publishing industry. They also dominate both where the research is being undertaken and who is being researched. For example, according to a recent study from the University of British Columbia, people from weird societies represent as much as 80% of study participants. And just a reminder, WEIRD stands for Western, Educated, Industrial, Rich and Democratic. So these people are being represented. But of course, these people are not representative of all humanity. And yet globally, these people gl represent about 12% of the world's population. So it's entirely likely that these findings are not representatives, are not representative. So Caroline says that she was reading a fascinating Twitter thread, which she includes, and she thinks it was very topical because it's about monkeypox. But more than that, it really highlighted the challenges that researchers outside of well-resourced Western nations and particularly African nations face in getting published. It was about an outbreak of monkeypox in Cameroon in 2018. The doctor who had been at the heart of the outbreak, who almost single-handedly identified and then implemented control measures, was encouraged to write it up as a case study for publication. And then, at every stage in the peer review process, 
it was rejected, largely because the reviewers wanted, quote unquote, additional epidemiological data or analysis that was not possible for an individual researcher working outside of a university or laboratory with no research funding, who later had to relocate from the area due to an escalation of conflict in the region. So this really, really valuable insight into the transmission and control of monkeypox outbreak went unheard of. And as the scientists behind the thread, Bohuma Kabisan Tanji said, so much more eloquently than I ever could about her colleague, a story being told should not depend on where, that's, on where that story is happening in the world. But as she says, this is just a, one of many, many examples of gatekeeping in scholars, scholarly publishing. And I'll just leave the side on this in case people want to take time to read and digest what she said. So we'll move on to the next slide. Caroline also wants us to focus about language because we saw on the slide earlier how much European and North American publishers dominate. But even within that group, English language publications are even more dominant. So when Caroline was looking through the SJR list of top to ranked journals, she had to scroll down to 42nd in the list before finding one that wasn't US or UK based. There were only four in the top 100 that weren't US and UK based, and even though it was still published in English. So what additional barriers does that create for researchers for whom English is not their first language? What about concepts that can't easily be translated into English or which there just isn't an equivalent word? I was having a fascinating conversation, Caroline writes, with an academic at my institution the other day who works in psychology and was telling an, an, an anecdote about a conversation she'd had with a student in her class who raised the issue that there's actually no word in Punjabi for depression and that equivalent words that can be used just don't quite capture the same concept. So language itself can be a barrier to understanding if we are forcing researchers to write in other languages in order to conform to the dominant structures of academic publishing, which were all established by and for Western academic institutions. So what does this mean? Well, a lot of this means that in order to truly diversify our resources, in order to truly diversify our collections, diversify our reading list, we can't just rely on our means of supply. We can't just rely on mainstream traditional publishing to do more than satisfy mainstream traditional needs. It's just not enough. So one of the things Caroline recommends is looking outside. Stop being so reliant on journals and textbooks. Let's broaden our horizons. Let's recognize that just because something comes from Elsevier or Springer or one of these large publishing companies doesn't automatically mean or guarantee quality. And just because something is self-published or on a blog or a preprint server doesn't mean that it isn't a quality piece of research. I think we probably all have come across examples of truly shocking research that ends up being printed for various reasons. For instance, Angie Wakefield and the MMR Autism Research is the one that springs immediately to mind. Even potentially less harmful examples of quote unquote fake research crop up. I was reading, for instance, something the other day on the Retraction Watch website which is a fab place to get an insight in how often errors slip through the cracks in scholarly publishing. So I was reading about an article about kale that was published in Food Science and Nutrition, a journal, which contained what one critic on Twitter described as, quote unquote, word salad, chunks of just utterly incomprehensible text. And it was like the entire paper was fake and had been passed by a compromised peer reviewer 
And these are, there are plentiful examples of things like this, of peer review scams, reviewers reviewing and passing each other's papers or something as their own. We've probably also heard about articles being rejected on grounds such as that they're based on bias, prejudice and error. There was one I remember seeing last year, which was a study that was rejected which was actually a really interesting piece of research on stem cell therapy using stromal cells from menstrual blood. I had to screenshot this response tweeted by one of the authors of the paper because it was truly mind boggling, particularly since this came from not just any peer reviewer, but the editor of a nature science journal. Let me read out my favorite bit. Almost all articles in the literature reported the severe, undesirable and toxic effects of menstrual blood and all its constituents on the human body. Even in all religions, it is well known that menstrual blood and its men SES, which stands for menstrual blood derived stem cells, are extremely, extremely toxic. And then Caroline says that her also her favorite bit was, quote unquote, in toxicological criminology, some women in some cultures use a very few drops of its potent toxic extract to secretly kill their husbands. Well, did you know women have this superpower at our hands? I mean, the complete lack of any kind of understanding of basic biology on display here let alone the total irrelevant mention of religion and the blatant misogyny is pretty staggering. And yet I suspect this is not unusual or an isolated case. And again, I'll just leave that um, slide up just in case people want to digest about what is was in a peer reviewed article, the type of quote unquote quality research that we are paying thousands for. I'm just gonna break in name, it's 20 past three already. So just to let you know. <laughs> okay, so I'm um, move on to the last slide then. So Caroline ends with saying that, of course, she's not saying to scrap it all, throw it all out. It's not achievable and it's not reasonable. There are perfectly valid reasons why some material should stay and why some voices are the experts but not in every case. And there is definitely a discussion to be had about access, privilege, education, and visibility. How information is generated and by whom, in what context, what we are not being told, and what should be part of the discussion, what should be part of the outcome and the impact. So what can we do? How can we address and overcome these issues? Honestly, if I had an answer to that, I would have led with it. But I don't have these answers, just suggestions. And these suggestions are teaching students about these issues, about the economics of information, how it's subject to market forces and how these forces are not neutral. Teaching about absence and why it exists is not accidental, it's a choice dictated by economic, political and social influences. And these are the structures that we as librarians and we as society need to dismantle. Finally, we should be teaching about the politics of peer review and how it relates to social policy, how in an information society, not even just who writes and researches and publishes, but who gets the recognition for doing so, whose work gets applauded and whose gets ignored. Our students need to understand the power of information in the world that they're going out into and how much it can be used positively and negatively. Our job is to make sure that they have the tools, the understanding and the inspiration to become aware of issues. Because if they're not aware of the issues, then this not only potentially continues disadvantages in the workplace, but prevents our ability to be agents of change in the world. Thank you for listening. I'm going to stop sharing my screen because we have our final 
presenter, but definitely last but not least, because I'm very excited for Ben's presentation personally. And Ben Chupasa is the social sciences and policy librarian with Columbia University Libraries. He engages and collaborates with faculty and students through information literacy instruction, research support and collection development across Columbia's social science departments, as well as its School of International and Public Affairs. Ben publishes and presents on topics related to data literacy, government information dissemination and access, and diversity in academic libraries. Additionally, as a certified Carpentries trainer, he teaches foundational coding and data science skills to researchers. Ben, it's over to you. Thank you so much, Naomi, and thank you so much to all the presenters. You all are wonderful. I have learned so much. And I think, you know, with being the last uh, one here, you know, a lot of, <laughs> of pressure is on me amongst like all of the, the wonderful uh, thoughts um, and, and really uh, uh, ideas about how can we envision a, a future that, you know, combats inequities. And really what I wanna focus on uh, today with you all is kind of, you know, we've, we've learned a lot more now, right? About uh, ways in which um, librarianship is being challenged. Um, our patrons are being challenged with regards to thinking about, um, algorithmic bias, the problems of AI, um, thinking about right the challenges of if we are gonna promote uh, digital services within our workspaces, how can we make them sustainable? Um, and really um, going, I, I really wanna focus on this idea of how we can build a, a community, facilitate a community that's structured around leveraging and teaching both um, internally, right? A uh, community of practice or learning circle of sorts within our fellow uh, colleagues um, uh, and the patrons we interact with, um, how that can all act as a vehicle for building a shared understanding of digital inequities. Um, so I'm gonna start off with this slide right here um, that um, I, I wanna think, for us, so I'll think about the creation of new sorts of um, uh, roles that we're seeing in academic librarianship. Um, we often find that these roles fall under what's known as like the digital librarianship umbrella. So I'm referring to roles such as data librarians, uh, digital scholarship librarians, uh, digital strategy specialists, and so forth. And within this ecosystem of um, academic librarianship, there's also roles that we agree to be critical or uh, necessary to uh, a functioning library, right? Um, um, I listed some of these examples in the lower right hand corner of the slide right here, but with a big caveat, right, being that what, what is deemed to be like must haves versus nice to haves in library workforces is gonna vary, right, depending on institutional priorities, uh, available resources, and so forth. And quite frankly, there's some right roles that we see in the bottom right hand corner that that could fall in the other silo and, and vice versa as well so um but that's not really the point i want to get across really the point i do want to get across is that despite these differing titles and roles and responsibilities uh, one common bridge that i do see um that connects all of us together um, with these roles is that we do some sort of teaching right um there is of course information literacy instruction which is arguably uh, commonplace and standard within our field. There's also uh, folks uh, who create teaching tools, resources, crafting finding aids, library guides. Uh, the reference desk, right, is a, a uh, environment for uh, teaching, right? We do it virtually in person um, and so forth. So, and also another thing that I would argue bridges all these roles together is that we interact with data in some way, shape, or form. Um, we are data suppliers, we are catalogers, metadata specialists. We are also data experts, I would argue, too. You know, we work with students on not only retrieving, helping them retrieve data, access data, but interrogate the data as well. Um, and we had just heard in the last presentation, right, a, a plea to do that in a way, and 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 the powers that uh that, that come can come with that. So so. Now I'd like to, for us to think about how the intersections of data um, and instruction can intersect. So, you know, whether 
you know, you are involved in a role that's tasked to build collections, remediate data, embed yourself in information literacy efforts. There's really a great opportunity, I'd say, for roles to come together to build a, a better shared understanding through teaching and learning of how information and data landscapes continue to be fueled by systemic uh, pressures that continue to perpetuate harm, as we've learned right from the from Naomi's um, introduction for today for non-majority groups, especially within our libraries, right? I'm referring to matters such as um, the reliance on AI that we've talked about, um, the reliance is how maybe we're indexing our, our collections, digital and physical and outdated terminologies. Um, so by coming together, I'd like now, you know, like just to think about how we can learn from one another too and how we can and practice and, um, teach the, this thing uh, related to data literacy. I want to focus on th this concept of data literacy since, uh, you know, this this could be something of more of like a jargon, uh, buzzword that we're seeing, you know, more and more common within the academic librarian sphere. But, but it also opens up a lot of opportunity too, in which we can um, have a, a better shared understanding and collective understanding of what it means within the work that we do. Because um, we all use data, right, in different ways, as I've already alluded to. Um, and knowing that, we can also empower, right, our patrons in, in terms of what they can do with the data that um, they work with, what data can do to us, right, and in harmful ways, as we've kind of uh, talked about already. Um, but on a more positive side of things, what kind of world we can create, right, with data to facilitate a more just world. So with that said, right, facilitating continuing education of um, uh, pedagogy, um, instruction, like all those sorts of things. It's not necessarily a new concept on paper. We, we see a lot of literature that talks about things like communities of practice, uh, learning circles, but ultimately at the end of the day, whatever uh, strategy we choose to deploy, I think it all comes down to um, the idea that by leveraging um, different kinds of literacies that are justice oriented, we can then pursue genuine digital equity, right? That not empowers our library patrons, but holds libraries accountable too, as well as the data we supply and interact with in our workplace, right? So it's that shared understanding that we can do, right? Right, things like uh, um, advocate for um, ourselves and combat some of the uh, the, the issues that we saw with e-resource production um, and, and pricing and dissemination that we, we talked about a little earlier. So um, it's worth, however, calling out the, the elephant in the room is that uh, our workplace structures oftentimes do not do the best job of facilitating cross collaboration, cross communication, right? So it all come in a way goes back to that, the, the silos that I, I kind of introduced to you um, in the beginning. And really the big point I wanna get across here is that opportunities are then missed quite frankly in digital librarianship spaces when there's no interaction happen. And um, for those who you know, doc, uh, occupy that you know, digital space um, and making the assumptions that those that don't, don't, but that's as we've learned already, right? That's not the case. Um, and the same could be like vice versa as well. So, so, um, so when I say this, right, like for example, like the data librarian, that that this role of the data librarian um, can work with those who are uh, with the title of instructional librarians, right? Come together, build build upon key pedagogies, find commonalities, and ultimately, I think for all involved in this collaboration, become better teachers, a uh, better inclusive teachers, those that are really intentional about creating spaces in which our students and library patrons are well equipped, empowered to interrogate uh, some of the systemic barriers uh, surrounding the use and access of data that we've um, discussed already. So. So why this work of coming together is so important is that um, there's also this dynamic of recognizing that there's a lot of theory and pedagogical frameworks that overlap with one another. So, um, and, and as um, Emily um, has put in chat too, right? Like scholars that have think, thought about this, um, like Leanne Bowler and so forth. So, so a lot of these conversations are happening, um, but one thing that we wanna avoid is that if there's one kind of particular uh, framework, pedagogical perspective that only resonates with one kind of librarian role or one kind of you know, librarian unit, then we'd be missing out, right? So 
Um, so really, uh, libraries should resist on relying on literacies that are exclusive to certain librarianship roles. Um, so for example, the idea that data literacy is only applicable for data librarianship spaces and information literacy in quotes is only applicable for instructional librarianship. So, so rather instruction focused data, digital information literacy librarians should really be open to seeing how different these different literacies overlap, how we can partner and really at the end of the day, right, work with our students to challenge the social, economic, political context of the production and consumption of information and data. So, so yeah, so as data literacy can continue to kind of develop as a, a concept evolve um, within the librarianship space, I think it's really important for librarians to both provide data and instruct with data to be part of that conversation. And a really great example of work out there right now is the Collections as Data movement, which makes it very explicit and clear that library resources, right, can serve as data sets in their own rights. Um, and recognizing too that catalogers, digital collection managers, and other analysts all have, in a way, uh, critical approaches to working with and teaching others how to use these data. So, so that, again, the idea of a shared understanding of how librarians with a variety of special uh, specialties can critically engage with data, can make it easier to embed these approaches holistically within the library organization as a whole. And as I've briefly alluded to, um, a first step might involve finding synergies between uh, different literacies that have um, kind of ultimately similar, maybe a little different, but a lot of times similar goals. Um, an immediate and most obvious kind of um, uh, one that, that resonates and, and we're familiar with and within librarianship is the, you know, Association for College and Research Libraries, ACRL's framework for information, uh, uh, the information for higher education's uh, six concepts that assist learners to become more information literate. literate. Um, the document is presented in a way that leaves room for flexibility, allowing for adaptation, interpretation. Um, um, there, there's many commonalities between uh, the framework and working definitions of uh, and concepts of data literacy, including um, the uh, uh, capacity to train our students to critically assess data and data provenance. So, so I, I've already thrown around, you know, the, this uh, word of data literacy, but but I want to also take a moment to kind of define it as well, since I hadn't yet really at its core, right, data literacy is the ability to read, work with, analyze, and communicate with data. Um, although some researchers see data literacy as maybe a more quantitative subdomain of the overarching info lit framework, but, but in, outside of academic librarians, right, right uh, data literacy is just a, a key component of robust information literacy. So, so because of these like differing kind of approaches, definitions, uh, a lot of the, uh, how we explain what data literacy is can be very, uh, can vary depending on the literature that we come across. Some focus on effectively um, making, how to effectively uh, make decisions using data, placing the importance on understanding of how a particular data set um, can help researchers address a certain question. Um, there might be other competencies related to the ethical provenance and citation of data, uh, and taking a look at hard um, a look at the biases resulted of why a data set is created in the first place. So, but in the theme of you know thinking about how we can identify systemic pressures that bias how we collect data, how we make data available, how we can use unfortunately use data to misconstrue in our storytelling. It's also worth talking about the idea too of critical information literacy. So critical information literacy really stresses the idea that um, existing information systems mirror a much larger social and political order, which is categorized by radically asymmetrical distribution of power um, that's all framed and, and influenced by things such as racism, sexism, homophobia, um, class oppression, and so forth. So really, in, in, in order for librarians to fully interrogate the role of power and information dissemination, there really needs to be this acknowledgement that libraries and the academy, right, have been historically white, uh, wrangling with the idea that libraries we have to say like rests on discriminatory past that is inherently uh, a dominant white space um, and how that affects uh, who we choose to hire, um, information classification systems and so forth. So, um, so 
With all that said, though, how do we create opportunities and spaces for literacies with similarly uh, similar goals um, to synergize? Um, I already mentioned this idea of coming together in something like a community practice or a learning circle. But one thing that can actually uh, be more helpful and intentional is to first really hit home um, some key recurring themes and topics that resonate with a lot of the work that we do, you know, whether you're a metadata librarian or an archivist. Um, so these are just three examples that I like to touch upon, you know, when we think about racism and its influence on pedagogy and instructional content. Um, in, a, in, a, in a quant kind of perspective, discussing problematic numbers that misconstrued that I mentioned earlier. Um, in, in US government, right, we rely on the US uh, Census Bureau to essentially um, count um, the American peoples, um, get data from that uh, channel. We get there's issues of undercounting Black people, Latino uh, communities, Native Americans, and what that means in terms of federal funding allocations for uh, all these programs um, out there um, that incorporate taxpayer dollars. Um, uh, as we've talked about already too, right, the, the concept of neutrality, uh, statisticians are so prone to ascertain that all quantitative data represents the truth and prescribes to a legitimate understanding of the world. We, we tend to gravitate towards this idea of raw data, um, but in fact, um, in a way like data is cooked, right? Uh, you know, why, how a data set um, kind of manifests itself is stems from uh, the methodologies we choose, the choices we make in terms of how we name variables, um, whose voices we choose to amplify, not amplify, not bring to the table at all. Uh, I think about work of, you know, Catherine uh, Ignazio's data, data feminism work that's uh, very in, uh, influential in these sorts of perspectives. So um, also thinking about categories and deficit mindsets, thinking about how do we facilitate, you know, this information sharing um, uh, component um, in a way that is uh, just and equitable and, and fair, because when we think about BIPOC students in higher education, um, you know, oftentimes uh, in higher education working with these students are often viewed through a deficit lens by academics and teachers. And how does this apply when we do uh, information literacy instruction or when we teach quantitative methods? And there can be a lot of overlap there as well. So, um, so challenges and opportunities. Um, so what are the, I mean, on paper, right, this idea of coming together, um, talking amongst ourselves, um, it seems very easy on paper, um, but it, it all comes down to the, the structure of how we have um, organized uh, all these different library roles, right? Uh, the legacy of how these roles get rearranged and how these roles, uh, these groupings have been normalized. Um, and really one thing I, I do wanna highlight too is like when we talk about this concept of data, right? This word of data, it's often tied to what we constitute as innovative, right? And, and innovation, you know, when we think in America, especially the, the Silicon Valley culture and how that's thereby um, inherently masculine, whereas, the, the act of teaching instruction that, that constitutes more emotional labor that is often considered to be unskilled, feminine. Um, and, and it's these like really gendered legacies of librarianship that makes arguably information literacy as a concept, it, it continues to be misunderstood and unrecognized outside of librarianship, right? Um, those that do instruction and which I do like always having to uh, negotiate with a, a faculty member, um, explain what I'm doing, my role and whatnot. It's a constant thing that, that never ends. And I, I would argue that it, it is tied to this gendered legacy of librarianship, which is ironic because, you know, if we think about information, uh, the role, because information literacy, right? Information is still valued, right? Like amidst this like very new liberalist knowledge economy that we are part of, that's commodifying information. The, the irony that, you know, that exists, but information literacy, eh, we're not going to deal with much. So, um, so although the opportunities to embed critical librarianship and data librarianship exist, I also want to say that there's, you know, differences between interrogating power and privilege in efforts towards dismantling structural inequalities versus doing that work opportunistically. So, um, for a BIPOC community, you know, we're seeing this ongoing prevalence of critical librarianship, um, admittedly veering towards performative. Um, and, and 
when we do this work, all, all I'm saying is like, we really do have to recognize, right, that librarians of color have been doing this work for quite a bit of time now without calling it theory, quite frankly. And, and the work uh, rests on decades of progress being made by librarians of color before a crit lip, right, movement has grown within these last uh, several years. So really that community practice, learning circle, however you group together, really needs to open opportunities that not only could engage with the work that librarians do, but should also turn a, really that critical eye upon itself. So how does, for example, the, the profession replicate structures of white supremacy in those cultures of information literacy, digital scholarship silos and so forth. So, so yeah, so my recommendation is not necessarily novel on paper, right? It's to suggest that different librarians with overlapping responsibilities related to teaching collections and data can and should come together to build that shared understanding of how information and data landscapes fueled by systemic pressures that harm and marginalize. Um, and since critical approaches to data and information literacy naturally invites librarians to challenge systems that they themselves must navigate around, right? Like when working with library catalogs, um, personnel, digital spaces. Um, we do that in a way too, that we also uh, foster dialogue on how to collectively deconstruct existing workplace silos, call out inequities in our practice and collections, all doing that while empowering our patrons and our students to be you know, data literate, to really advocate um, for, for actual change. So uh, thank you very much. And that was my talk. Thank you so much, Ben. Like I said, last but definitely not least, definitely some things that, well, everyone has said things I know we'll be reflecting on long after this webinar has finished. So thank you once again. Um, and to all the speakers who have given up their time and created such fascinating um, provocations. Um, so we have 15 minutes left before the webinar formally finishes so I don't know if there's anybody who has questions um Alison I'm not sure if